It's really an honor to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, Dr. Natalie Azar. She is a rheumatologist at the New York Langone Medical Center, as well as an associate professor of rheumatology at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. As well as many of you may be very familiar with Dr. Azar as she's an NBC News medical contributor. And she really has been a leading voice and face in the fight against COVID this past year. You've seen her all over television, making sure that the general population is educated um, on the disease as well as on vaccinations. And so it's an honor to have her here this evening to help us moderate the various panels that we have going on. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Natalie Azar. Thank you so much, Steve, for that warm introduction and welcome to everybody. I'm very excited to be your moderator this evening. We're gonna kick it off with a, uh, a study out of Johns Hopkins. We're gonna have a discussion with the senior author, Dr. Lisa Christopher and her colleague, Dr. Quelan Connolly about a study that was released a few weeks ago in the Division of Rheumatology at Hopkins on just how rheumatology patients are faring after two doses of the COVID mRNA vaccines. I'm sure everyone listening today as my patients have, have been very, very curious about how they're going to respond to the vaccination. And after that, we're going to address your COVID questions with our panel, uh, which includes Dr. Jeffrey Curtis. He is the co-author of the American College of Rheumatology COVID-19 Vaccine Guidelines, as well as Marguerite Jones Harbert, the Jean Ball Endowed Professor of Medicine, UAB Division of Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology, Dr. Elaine Husney, the Vice Chair of Rheumatology and Director of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Center at the Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. Yuki Kimura, who is the Chief in the Division of Pediatric Rheumatology at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine and the Co-Chair for the CARA Research and Registry Oversight. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to welcome Drs. Christopher and Dr. Connolly to talk to us about their study. And we're going to start just with some mechanics. This study was a prospective observational study of patients with rheumatic disease. I'd like to pose the question to Drs. Christopher and Connolly, what does it mean in lay terms to have a prospective observational study? Great, so I can uh, jump in and take that one. And thank you very much for having us um, on this webinar today. But essentially, a prospective study means, you know, a study in which we're evaluating um, events that occur over time moving forward. Um, in prospective studies, patients are followed over time, uh, and that helps answer questions about risk factors or associations with certain outcomes. Um, an observational study is exactly what it says on the tin, uh, you know, participants are observed over, you know, time, there's no intervention um, to affect the outcome of interest. Great. And so the number of participants in the study was uh, over 1,000. It was 1,377. Is this, is this a good sample size, not a good sample size? Is this representative? Can we draw conclusions, uh, you know, for the country at large based on a study of this size? Sure, I'll take that. So I think it is, in general, a fairly large sample size. In this particular subject matter, it's the largest to date on this subject. We felt like it was a good representation across all of the main rheumatologic diagnoses, like arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, as well as even less common entities, things like myositis or scleroderma or vasculitis. So not only was it large in scope, it really included the patients that we would like to have uh, included in the study. Um, so there were a few variables that weren't necessarily um, considered, such as differences in baseline disease activity, as well as the length of time that somebody might have had disease prior to, to study enrollment. Does that affect the interpretation of the outcomes at all, or how do you, how do you explain that? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the strengths of this study included our ability to recruit a very large number of patients very quickly um, across the entire United States, and we have representation from all co uh, corners of the country. Um, and I think that's really, really important um, in this rapidly changing COVID landscape, um, you know, to get that data quickly. Um, it's very difficult to assess baseline disease activity with the physician's input, um, and we just didn't have that because it's not feasible given the size and, the, you know, the span of the participants that were included in the study. So it certainly is a limitation. Um, but we did ask patients about, you know, number of disease flares prior to vaccination, which we used as a surrogate of sorts for disease activity. Um, and then I don't remember the exact number. Was it 90%? It was 
pre a preponderance of females um, in the study. So if you're a man listening to this talk, can you extrapolate? Can, can you make any inferences with regards to our male patients based on these study results? Sure, it's a great question. And better for worse, as you know for sure that autoimmune disease in general is probably very, very female predominant in lupus dramatically. So for example, that's nine to one, if we look at the ratio of women to men, 78% of patients with autoimmune disease are women. So it, our representative sample represented the disease, uh, you know, the disease, it re represented the population who has the disease. Rheumatoid arthritis, two times more common in women. Myositis, three times more common in women. So while men it made up only 8%, we did gather on uh, over 100 men, I think it was 111 male participants. And what I think is important is we didn't see any difference in flare between the genders. So, and we have no reason biologically to think that gender would modulate flare rates. So to the best of our ability, understanding that this represents autoimmune disease as it affects the population, we have no reason to suspect that the men in the study would not be representative of the general population of men. So now let's get to let's get to the money. Let's uh, let's hear what you guys found. <laughs> so I, mean, I think that if we're if you want the the money, I'd say that what's wonderful about this is that we answered a question that patients ask us every day: Will I flare? What's going to happen if I take this vaccine? And rather than guessing, we can give data. So I think the best take home is that COVID-19 vaccines are generally quite safe in patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal uh, diseases. The benefits of vaccination far, far outweigh any potentially life-threatening risks. We showed that even though flares were possible, really the chance of hospitalization or serious complications was nil. So I think it's wonderful that we can not only guess, but really no. You know, what was interesting is that I think the number was around 10% or something like that, uh, right? 11 out of 100 or something like that would, would have experienced a flare, but mild, yep. right? Right, Lisa? Very. Um, and I Absolutely. thought about, yeah, and I thought about, I don't know if you guys have experienced this in the office, but I'm like, that's probably maybe one a day, right? I mean, if we all see at least 10 patients a day, and I think that that maybe does mirror, it certainly I think mirrors a little bit what I'm seeing. I've definitely had some patients have flares, but the, but the vast majority that I'm not even thinking about that I'm seeing day in and day out have done just fine. So, you know, I think, I think your study is probably matching very much uh, some real world experience from at least from this rheumatologist. I'm curious if you guys um, in your own private patients have seen something similar to the study results. Yeah, I think most have tolerated it well. Yeah, I think part of the problem is that a lot of the same things, myalgias or muscle aches and you know the symptoms uh, or side effects from the vaccine can also mimic the exact same things we see some players for our diseases. So even trying to tease that out was even more tedious, but I did not see any overwhelming flares that would hospitalize a patient. And anecdotally, exactly what you're saying, Natalie, I think we saw the same in practice that yeah. patients really did tolerate well. Right. Well, if there's anything else that doctors Christopher or Connolly would like to add about the study, um, let me know. Otherwise, we're probably going to be moving on to our questions. No, and I if you don't, you guys, thank you so much for doing this study. I mean, you know, it, it is so, so important. And so I'm so thrilled to be sharing that you're sharing it with us. This is really great information for, for patients to hear. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for having us. And again, you know, we were we were really encouraged by you know the positive findings that you know the benefits of vaccination by far outweigh you know the the risks associated with uh, COVID nineteen infection. Um, I think another take home was that you know people should expect some side effects. Um, I think that's reflected you know in you know real world data in the general population as well. Um, so just setting that expectation is important. Uh, but all the side effects um, were mostly mild. Um, so generally very well tolerated and the benefits uh, greatly outweigh the risks of infection. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, now so we're much. going to welcome uh, Drs. Husney, Kimura, and Curtis. We received well over 500 questions. So we're gonna try to address as many of them as we can. Um, and I am going to kick it off. Um, Dr. Husney mentioned right before we started that all she, gets, all she talks about all day is boosters. So I'm gonna give this first question to her. 
Uh, Dr. Husney, how important is it to get a third dose? Natalie, uh, yes, my inbox has been exploding with vaccine booster questions, and rightly so, because as we are, as we just heard, you know, data is coming in at us, you know, at a very fast rate. But we're so glad to get um, data, and and we are trying to communicate that as fast as we could. In terms of importance for uh, the booster, I think right now, as uh, CDC guidelines had laid out. Um, that we in certain subgroups right now, especially those that are immunocompromised that we all see as rheumatologists, um, those that are at a higher risk for poor outcome, um, do, um, you know, we recommend them to get um, the, um, uh, the booster. Um, so that, you know, is probably a lot of the patients that we see um, based on the immunosuppressive medications that they're on, based on, you know, some of the age, their comorbidities um, that they all um, may have. Um, and do patients, Elaine, maybe you'll just, uh, we'll wrap this one with you. Do you need to get approval from the rheumatologist to get a third dose um, or is it just self-attestation? Yeah, you know, that is such an interesting question because I thought that there would be some process. I will tell you in Ohio, where I practice at the Cleveland Clinic, you do not need um, your rheumatologist um, to, you know, write a letter or um, you can actually go, you know, we're giving it at our hospital. There's also local places, you know, local pharmacies um, that are also offering. Um, so to, to the best of my knowledge, we do not need that in Ohio. You can go and um, get that. Right. And again, as you point out, it might and may differ based on what your, you know, state or local, you know, health authorities are are requiring. But per the CDC, um, self-attestation is sufficient. So, um, Dr. Curtis, uh, do you need to consider the medication that you're taking timing? Is there any adjustment that is necessary around any dose? But in particular, now we're talking about boosters and people who've received their initial series. Sure. So that's a great question. And very helpfully, and this is the first time I've been able to have this conversation since this is only two hours old, but I put in the chat window the newest guidance from that ACR task force that you mentioned that I sit on and, and lead, where several of the topics that we're covering that you posed um, almost presciently are addressed here. So on behalf of the ACR, who has weighed in on this in a formal way, it essentially lays out who should get a booster. And it's pretty much everybody with rheumatic diseases on any of the usual immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory treatments, except for hydroxychloroquine. So people who are on hydroxychloroquine only by itself would not be considered probably in this group. So people who might be worried that you're gonna be refused, I've definitely heard of that, albeit anecdotally, or think they need a prescription or some sort of note or attestation, like you literally can point to this guideline and say, hey, I'm on this medicine. You don't even have to worry about like what your diagnosis is. It's really the medicine that I think makes life quite simple for this. So that should be enough. And that's one of the bolded statements in table two two in this link that I just shared with you all. The question that you asked is table three, what do I do with my medicines at the time that I might get a booster? So the ACR recommended, and this is also in, if you follow that link. So the task force guide uh, guidance statement that speaks to that would recommend that for almost all immunomodulatory medications that you hold them for one to two weeks after you get a booster. So that doesn't apply to every single medicine and probably because your circumstance may vary, talk to your rheumatology provider about you know, how this might need to be, be uh, modified for you. But by and large, for most of the therapies, you would hold for one to two weeks after you get a booster. And that's not predicated on a safety issue. It's intended to maximize the vaccine response. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a great study like the one from Hopkins about like on which to base that evidence. So at present, this is really expert opinion. And in fact, our, our group within the next month is, is starting a very large study um, that will explicitly test that hypothesis to figure out, do you need to do that? You know, what is the flare rate? What's the safety tolerability look like? That'll be done at dozens of different centers across the country. But for what we know now, um, you know, this is sort of the best guess. The one thing, though, that is an exception that I might point out is 
for some therapies like the TNF biologics, that would be, you know, and I'll use the brand names because patients are more familiar with that, Embril or Humira, but that would be Symphony, that would be Simzia, Remicade, um, as well as a handful of others, Cosentix, Taltz, the, the whole list is there and you can check it out. Um, the panel essentially couldn't decide. So those are the ones that are called cytokine inhibitors, and there is a long list there. And there were some people who felt that based on the literature for other vaccines that, you know, maybe those therapies might have some small impact on vaccine or booster response. Other people said, we, we really just don't have evidence to be very worried about that. So there wasn't consensus about whether to hold those. So again, talk to your rheumatologist, but for all the other medicines, um, there was this recommendation to probably hold. Thanks, Dr. Curtis. And I'll just add that um, some of this research actually came out of our um, institution many months ago. Uh, you know, we did our work on, on our patients and we did see a blunted response in about a third of patients on methotrexate, a significantly lower response. So, um, and that was actually cited as, as, as one of the papers that uh, the ACIP committee um, yeah, Consider no, and the task force the reviewed that, and, and I appreciate that. So yes, methotrexate would definitely be among those that would be recommended to hold. If somebody was only, say, on Humira by itself or Embril by itself, there was a little bit less certainty about that circumstance, or at least there was less consensus about that kind of a scenario, but totally agree. If you're on methotrexate with anything, probably should hold the methotrexate. Yep. Okay. Um, Dr. Kimura, we're going to get you in here. Um, so we know that initially um, we, we sort of had a narrative that kids weren't as likely to get COVID. And if they do get COVID, they're not going to get very sick. Um, but we know now, you know, if you're, if you're listening to the news, um, significant rise in the number of pediatric hospitalizations. How worried should we be about our children who are too young to qualify for the vaccine at this time? Well, uh, that's a great question. And um, I think Part of the answer is that, you know, we, we actually don't know how many children actually uh, had COVID um, at the outset because most children are indeed uh, asymptomatic. But with the rise of um, the Delta variant, um, which is much more contagious, um, you know, we are seeing increased numbers of children who are symptomatic, who get COVID, as well as adults um, because of, of the Delta virus. So, um, so we need to, um, you know, really take precautions, um, you know, to um, help our children who are un who are unable to get the vaccine at this moment, um, and that is by getting the vaccine yourself and um, getting all the adults around your children vaccinated, as well as the most important thing would be, you know, to, for your child to wear masks um, when indoors uh, with other people, you know, such as at school. This does not apply to immediate family members, um, but that is really the best protection uh, for your child. Okay, wonderful. And I'm Dr. Kamara, I'm gonna add one more um, to you. If children with JIA are more susceptible to COVID-19 because of the medications they take, should they be homeschooled? And should toddlers avoid daycare if possible? Well, that's a question you know we get all the time as well. Um, we, we certainly, uh, it isn't that the JIA or rheumatic diseases in children make them more susceptible. Um, it is the immunosuppressive medications that they take that may increase the risk of infection slightly. Um, but we really do not advocate for children to be homeschooled. Um, children should uh, go to school and be with their peers and learn with their peers. That is the best way for, for our children to be educated. And again, as I said, um, you know, these, uh, the, the best protection really for your child is for them to be masked uh, and for the other children to be masked at school, if at all possible, and for uh, the adults around them, the teachers uh, to be vaccinated. Um, as far as daycare, that's a good question because toddlers aren't able to tolerate wearing masks. So um, that makes the situation more difficult uh, in um, situations like, you know, when they have to go to daycare. Um, but um, if the children are uh, in a small cohorts, I would say, uh, of the same children, uh, and if, again, the daycare workers are also vaccinated, then the risk should be very small, uh, uh, even in daycare. Um, so I'm going to pose the next question to Dr. Husney and then Dr. Curtis and 
Dr. Kimura, I would love to hear your opinion as well, because this is a conversation that I have with my patients all the time. Antibody testing. Is it worth checking a spike protein? How do you interpret it? Um, what should I do if my value is undetectable? What does that mean? Dr. Husney, you want to take a stab? So to me, I would love to know antibody status and if it correlated with our clinical findings. So unfortunately at this time, uh, the assays that uh, we have um, probably do not do that. So in theory, I completely understand this question. I get it all the time. We are not doing antibody testing prior to getting a booster or uh, you know, after getting the infection itself and to see how much antibodies you have. I do think in theory, it makes sense um, to want to know this, but unfortunately it hasn't panned out that uh, we have the technology um, to know that the, whatever your antibody titer might be, whether how much it might correlate. There's a lot of studies going on, which I'm sure um, Jeff can also share with us, but at this point, we're not recommending that. Um, but in theory, we're, we're you know, hoping one day we get um, to, to that point. We also don't know if you have you know, no antibodies, um, you know, does that mean you definitely have to get you know, more boosters? Or if you have antibodies, do you have a get out of jail card free, right? So we don't know those spectrums. Um, I don't know if I would feel comfortable even getting that test result back and you know, actually having an actionable clinical um, judgment on that. I think Elaine's response was great, and it's maybe at best a curiosity, but the problem is exactly as she outlined. What do you do with it? You know, if it's undetectable, it's mostly not antibodies that protect humans against viruses. It's the other side of your immune system. So, but many people will be very alarmed, but we don't know that they need to be. And in fact, there were people that were negative for antibodies and yet still seem to have protection in some of the big trials where those things were measured. Um, and conversely, you know, if you have detectable spike antibody, does that mean that you're really protected and you don't need to mask? No, probably not. And whatever your level is today, you think it's going to be the same in four to six months? Probably not. So it's really the interpretability that I think is so thorny. And that's why in those ACR recommendations, which again, were affirmed in the last 72 hours, um, that because we don't know what to do with it or how to interpret the result in a way that makes sense for patient care as an individual uh, and not just groups of people, then it's not routinely recommended. The only other kind of testing though I would make mention of, and somebody put it in the chat window. So there might be some rheumatology providers that wanna measure some aspects of B cells. If their patients are on a B cell depleting therapy like rituximab, there might be some merits to that. And not all rheumatologists do that or even have it available, but if you are on rituximab that might be, or, or, or considering that, that might be something that could be useful if that's available. Kimora, do you have anything um, to add? No, I, I don't really have anything to add. I think, um, you know, uh, Jeff and Elaine covered it very well. Um, and we certainly have even less data in uh, children uh, than in adults. Um, so, you know, we really don't routinely recommend uh, antibody testing, again, because we don't know how to interpret the results. You know, I will, I will just share that prior to... Um, Prior to the CDC's formally uh, making their recommendation on Friday to not test prior um, after they met, we had an internal discussion within our group and we said, listen, if we want to check patients commercially and we all understand that, you know, I've gotten some results back where I'm given a spike protein antibody greater than 20, that doesn't mean anything to me. I've had some people come back with 400, some people 2000. And what we, when I explain to patients and to all of our listeners tonight is that we don't know yet what that correlative protection is, which is what we're trying to communicate to all of you is that we don't know what, what minimal, what minimum level is sufficient for protection. But what we, what we said we would, we could do for some patients who are like, I just got vaccinated. Do I need to be vaccinated again? You know, with the 28 day uh, wait after the second dose is to check and if their antibodies were indeterminate or negative, we would refer to our research group who was going to be doing some more testing on the T cells and everything like that. And just to sort of double down a little bit on Dr. Curtis's point, we, we got so, I mean, we in the media were part of the problem and I, and I take some responsibility for that, talking about antibodies, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies and how important the antibodies are. And just to remind everyone, you know, the antibodies are that first line of defense when you get, when you get exposed to a virus, They're, they neutralize the virus, they try to get rid of the virus right away. And then after that, they go away. 
And then we have B cells that are sort of just, you know, ready and waiting to be um, to be triggered by another exposure to the virus to start churning out more antibodies. And then as Dr. Curtis was mentioning, the T cell arm of the immune system, which is really the important one that most people think, you know, virologists and, and immunologists understand is the most important protection. So I think we're probably gonna go back to no more testing prior to uh, boosters. It just seems uh, cleaner that way. Um, okay, do we have any information, Dr. Husney or Dr. Curtis, um, about the COVID vaccine efficacy in patients who have erosive OA and degenerative arthritis? Are we even looking at that? Um, or have our, all of our efforts been concentrated on our uh, inflammatory immune mediated diseases? So I do wanna, if, if you don't mind, um, Natalie, to take 30 seconds back, you know, Jeff reminded me um, as he was talking about rituxan, I, I don't think that all the immunosuppressive medications can be lumped all together. And That's so I just, point. before I forget, I, I did want to just kind of bring that up um, in this group chat that I do think that rituxan, which is a B cell re, um, depleter um, agent, and we also have, you know, they're using B cell depleting agents in multiple sclerosis like ocrelizumab, right? So there's other disciplines that are going to weigh in on this, but I believe that, uh, you know, drug itself is probably going to be a little bit more troublesome because, you know, they're really depleting the B cells, which is, you know, a, a big arm of the army that's going to fight this um, disease. And so I think in those patients, um, we are, you know, seeing some what we call breakthrough infections um, sometimes, you know, because those patients may not respond. Um, so they may not, they're not all equal as we're lumping um, uh, you know, all these uh, immunosuppressive medications. And so that's why we had mentioned that maybe B cell panels that we can check uh, in certain institutions may, may or may not be helpful, but gives us another piece of information. So I think it's important for the patients that are listening that depending on what you are on, you know, you may get a little tweaks of what your rheumatologist might tell you. And it's not that we're trying to go against each other, but it just depends on, you know, the exact medication you're on. So for rituximab, we may be trying to, you know, really fine tune that you get your vaccination at your trough, you know, you don't, you know, maybe not wanting to get it one or two weeks right after you got your rituxan um, treatment, not because of efficacy and not because of safety issues, as I said, but because we want to give you the best efficacy. And I think too, I think it's important, Elaine, um, and, and I think, you know, I was, I was, there were a few things that I thought were curious emissions from the CDC on Friday, and that was completely ignoring uh, folks over the age of 65, where we know that there's natural right immune senescence as one ages, our immunity declines, but they were sort of left out of that group um, as immunocompromised or with weakened immune systems. And I think it was really unusual that they clumped all of our medic medicines together, right? So we had our monoclonals and anti-metabolites and biologics. And as we all know, we don't we don't, I've been telling all my Enbrel patients, don't worry, you probably made a good response. So um, it's just, I think, always remember the CDC is doing, is giving guidance and then always make these decisions, you know, with your own personal doc and, and, and a, a shared decision-making. So, um, okay, so anyway, so do we know, do we have any information, Elaine, on um, erosive OA or degenerative arthritis? Are we even studying that or is that not a concern? Um, so did you say erosive OA or R? Erosive OA and OA. degenerative arthritis in terms of vaccine response efficacy. I don't, I'm not aware of anything, any yeah, study. I, I, I am not aware. I think, you know, we are really probably more focused on the uh, treatment oriented imids, right? So because we know that that can influence um, our vaccine efficacy response. Um, but maybe um, Kamaro or Jeff have other studies for osteoarthritis. Um, Dr. Curtis or Dr. Kimura, did any, uh, anyone aware of anything on degenerative or erosive OA and vaccines? So I would think that it would be, the answer to the question is largely, pre largely predicated on what kinds of treatments that somebody's on. So sometimes people get treated with low dose steroids like prednisone or even methotrexate. So I would probably expect that as you already pointed out, Natalie, that you know methotrexate probably blunts vaccine response. And so I would expect that regardless of why you're on methotrexate, if you're on it for erosive OA or you're on prednisone for erosive OA, that it may matter a little bit less why you're on that medicine. If you're on that medicine, it's gonna influence vaccine response. On the other hand, if you're only say on ibuprofen, Motrin, Celebrex, something like that, probably there's not that much of an effect on vaccine response and I wouldn't be too worried. Great. Um, all right, so one of the biggest questions 
I got the J and J vaccine. Um, this EUA was for a, an mRNA booster. If if and when I'm allowed to get a booster, or even if I'm not allowed to get a booster, should I get a third, a second J and J, or should I get a uh, mRNA? I'll open that to anyone. So currently, as we know, the CDC is recommending that, um, you know, this is, we, we only know uh, data for mRNAs, right? So that's the Pfizer and the Moderna. And um, currently we are recommending that you get the same type of vaccine uh, for the booster. So if you have Pfizer, you, you stay with the Pfizer um, booster. Um, I know that there's been small studies done where people have tried to look at, I don't know if Kimora or Jeff, um, have seen some really small studies um, uh, doing the opposite to see if you can get some broader, you know, um, coverage. But um, we are not recommending that. We're recommending you to stay with the same mm -hmm. class of vaccine. And, I, and just I, to be I, clear, I think we've reached the limits of what we know with any sizable amounts of data. Um, and so sometimes what gets recommended is simply who did what kind of a study. You know, if you have evidence that something works, then that something, in this case, you had Pfizer vaccination, get a Pfizer booster, you had Moderna vaccination, get a Moderna booster. If you have evidence that something probably works, then that's what ends up in guidance or guidelines. But in a circumstance where you really don't have very much or very good data, maybe you don't have any data, that tends not to get recommended, but it doesn't actually mean that it's a terrible idea. In fact, the ACR task force that voted on this very issue, because patients who got the J&J &J vaccine may feel rather stuck, they stayed silent. Some people said, how could we recommend something that there's almost no evidence for, at least in you know, rheumatology patients? And other people said, well, yeah, you don't have evidence for it, but it's probably not a bad idea. You just don't have evidence for what happens. So that's why you'll not see anything you know, for or against, because people felt a little bit differently. You know, if after talking to your rheumatology provider, you might want to get a booster, that's not unreasonable. It's just not very well supported by any study, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, I, I, think, I think the Johnson & Johnson folks um, have, in, from the beginning, it's always been, you know, a, the, the rollout or the, the authorization was, you know, a few months after the mRNA. So everything, and I think J and J patients feel this urgency, right, to um to be part of the conversation about the boosters. But um, you know, Johnson and Johnson, of course, as we know, is approved in March. So even if we're doing that eight month um, you know, timeline, that wouldn't make them eligible until uh, I guess December or so. Um, but you know, the most recent, the largest you know, amount of, of evidence right now. There was some discrepancy with Johnson & Johnson's uh, effectiveness, but a, a, a recent study out of South Africa really showed that it does hold up quite well, especially against severe disease. And just a, a point about the mixing and matching, because I think that's a, a very common question because mRNA vaccines really got the spotlight for so long. Um, you know, they did do this in the UK with the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine and, and did a mix and match study. And in fact, the mixing and matching does quite well than two AstraZenecas alone. Um, and I know Moderna is doing a, a mix and match study. So hopefully some of that information will, will inform these recommendations for us moving forward as well. Um, okay, so a big question, um, Yuki, on masks for kids returning to school. Um, what kind should they wear? Should they wear surgical, KN95, cloth mask? And if it's cloth, how many layers? Can you just, can you do a mask 101 for us? Um, well, I think that um, as long as you wear a, a mask um, that has at least, you know, two layers or a surgical mask, um, you know, that should really should be adequate um, for most kids. Um, as long as they, the mask um, fits their face, I think that's really important um, and that it's comfortable uh, for the children to wear um, so that they can tolerate it. I think those are the most important qualifications and certainly they don't need to, to wear a KN95 masks um, at school. Um, that would definitely not be recommended. Um, okay, Elaine, if you've, if someone has already had COVID, do they need to get vaccinated at all? 
And then if they've been fully vaccinated, but got COVID, should they get a third dose? Great, great uh, conversation. I'm laughing at that question because I'm not sure I know the answer to it. Right, right. Um, definitely a scenario that I've come through um, in my practice. So um, understand why people are writing about it. Whether or not I have data to support um, what to do, um, it's probably going to be a case by case basis. Um, we know that if you have um, undergone, um, you know, a COVID back, uh, COVID infection, you know that you have your own natural immunity, and that, and as we know, um, we had not been recommending people to get vaccinated right after a COVID um, infection. We had recommended 90 days um, at least. So, so I think that 90 days probably is coming. Um, from, you know, some evidence that, you know, you have your own um, immunity for some point where that line sort of starts waning is probably what we don't know, you know, when do you kind of lose all that and that you would gain more benefit from getting a booster if you were already vaccinated. And then if you were never vaccinated and you had a COVID infection, you know, are we, are we you know, are we good or not? So, so I think um, that we still have really um, you know, good evidence that there's things that we can do in situ situations where it's not clear. So masking, social distancing, you know, probably not going out, you know, if you're at high risk to Disney World, you know, even though I'm actually a big fan of Disney World. But but I think there's also common sense approaches that you can do. Um, it's not just an end all be all, you know, the vaccine, um, yes, no, booster, yes, no. So, so I think that's going to play um, a role um, into you know uh, these situations where it's a little bit more more gray. Um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, this one's for you. Mask guidance keeps changing. Should rheumatic disease patients plan to wear masks for the rest of the year once we are outside of a family bubble, um, or that we're guaranteed to be fully vaccinated? That you know that everyone is fully vaccinated with whom you are. So I think it's a great question. It's a tough question because if you say yes, it's gonna make people afraid and maybe that's not warranted and that will exceed public health guidelines. On the other hand, if somebody says, I feel more comfortable, I would say, you know, go with that and do what you're comfortable with. You know, here's where the spectrum of illness and treatments and, you know, how your disease is under control really plays in. You know, if somebody's on steroids and some of the more potent immunosuppressive therapies, I'd say, yeah, probably I as your doctor would recommend that unless that's incredibly burdensome. You know, if you have a school teacher who is, you know, constantly exposed, who's on some of these medicines, I'd say yes. On the other hand, if you have somebody who lives in a rural area, doesn't have much contact except at the grocery store once in a blue moon, I'd say, you know, probably not necessary. So I think everybody's situation is going to vary a little bit. And I think it's hard to overgeneralize. Um, but to make a blanket statement that applies to every drug, every disease, every therapy is probably too sweeping and you're going to get it wrong for too many people. So better to just personalize care and talk to your provider. Okay, good. Um, and then this is for any of you, actually. Um, so we talked a little bit about, we know that rituximab and methotrexate are definitely uh, known for their ability to blunt the response uh, to the vaccine. Do we know anything else about, let's say, JAK inhibitors? Um, we mentioned TNF's probably okay. I think there was some data on mycophenolate. Um, does anyone have any other input on that? And of course, steroids. Do you so know that, you how look, the JAK inhibitors do? If you look in the guidance statements, so JAK inhibitors do appear to blunt vaccine and probably booster response. And there's a couple of studies that have looked at all the therapies you just named. Kind of the way you know, the answer to your question is, if you look at what the ACR guidance suggested that you hold or temporarily interrupt for a week or two, Anywhere there's a temporary interruption, probably it means that response is blunted. The only caution about that is just because vaccine response is blunted by, say, mycophenolate or Celsept, doesn't mean that you can hold it for a week or two and be guaranteed that all is well. Um, but the therapies are listed in that big table. And, you know, if it says you should interrupt it when you get primary vaccination, uh, you know, abatacept, the JAK inhibitors, probably that is well supported by at least some evidence. Um, Yuki, I'm going to throw this one to you because um, a lot of people have questions about traveling if they're fully vaccinated, um, but may not have children who are vaccinated. Can you give us some, your opinion, 
well, guidance on that? <laughs> that's a, a thorny question that um, you know we get asked a lot, and I think it really um, depends on the situation and depends on uh, where you're going. Um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, a trip to uh, Disney World is probably not a great idea um, if you have unvaccinated people or children uh, in in your in your group. Um, but you know, small family trips uh, to places uh, where you stay safe and mask in, uh, indoors, um, and your children mask indoors um, is probably uh, okay. Um, it's you know, it's a big world out there though, and there's you know lots of uh, guidance that keeps changing in terms of of uh, COVID and uh, in the world, and so. You know, we really need to keep uh, tabs on on all of that, um, and uh, you know, uh, look at the travel sites, um, CDC guidelines, um, WHO guidelines, etc., in terms of where it's safe to travel. Um, Elaine, this one to you. Um, if you've had a bad flare after getting the first shot, um, should you get the second one, and should you time it any differently? So I think many of us have answered questions about um, flares after the first, some have it after both, some have to after just the second one. In my experience, most of them have been self-limited, um, but I do hear a lot about, um, you know, minor flares as well as major flares, you know, flares just locally in the injection site all the way up to flares of your disease. Uh, so far, I have um, really felt that the benefits of the vaccination far outweigh some of the harms. I also see a lot of self-limiting um, issues. So, uh, you know, many of what I see um, have been um, self-limited. Now, I do have a handful of cases, which I'm sure the other panelists have also had, where it has been a real flare after the first. And I was actually quite um, weary about going to the second. So I think it does depend. But majority wise it's mostly self-limiting so i only have maybe a handful up in you know in this whole um year since the the vaccination pandemic has happened in terms of um flare where i recommended to one or two people that it was such a flare that required steroids to get back on track that i decided that perhaps maybe we should wait a little longer for the second but those are very very tiny tiny amounts okay. um so i'd like to pose this question um to our adults and then our pediatrics, because um, I'm curious if we have data on all. So what is the latest on how autoimmune patients are faring with COVID severe illness and hospitalization? So Elaine and Jeffrey first. So if, if autoimmune patients and severe illness, it means like, if you get COVID, do you have more severe illness? Then I think, yeah, we do have some well-powered population-based studies suggesting that patients with rheumatic diseases probably do fare worse for severe or for hospitalized COVID. That in part is why it's so important to get vaccinated and to get a booster because we want people maximally protected because it looks like people do have worse outcomes. There's also cases of breakthrough infection or manifestations. So I think that also increases the concern for that as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think as a whole, I do want to mention that, um, uh, you know, just from hospitalizations, just kind of a generalized um, comment that since the vaccinations have occurred, I've seen a lot less, you know, sort of um, severe, you know, infections in both, you know, immunocompromised and non-immunocompromised. So I just wanted to put that out there. I think, you know, we're also learning better how to take care of these patients. They're vaccinated. I do think that there is um, been a huge benefits. Um, now, on, on the other side, while I'm a hospital rounds, I, I do, you know, see patients that may have worse outcomes um, and they are immunosuppressed. I also notice that it's not just being immunosuppressed, but they also have a lot of other comorbidities. So being overweight, having heart disease, having, um, you know, heart failure. Uh, so there are other issues in a patient that may also predispose them to maybe a, a little bit more poor outcome. Um, so I do think that, you know, it's a nice wake up call sometimes. I know that there might be a question later on about what to do about your immune system. And I do think that 
from the cases I see that have worse outcome, this is a good wake up call to say, you know, if you are overweight or you are a smoker, this is time now, you know, I think the pandemic was a good wake up call for us to say, hey, maybe we should adjust these, um, these lifestyle factors that we have control over because I think they make a difference. Um, and, you know, I think we, we have a lot of lifestyle choices that we make and I think it's been, you know, really important now um, to maybe pay attention to those and to, to kind of rebalance some of those things that we have control of. Um, Yuki, have you seen any, um, any characteristics of the kids who are admitted um, with JIA? Uh, you know, is it steroids? Is there, are there any biologics that seem to be, um, you know, showing up in the ED more frequently? Or is it also like we're seeing in the adult population the comorbidities that our patients have that are really the, the culprit mostly. I'm just turning off my video for a second. I have to close my blinds. I'm going blind. <laughs> um, I think that uh, in general, uh, this, you know, the same statements hold for children. I mean, we have far fewer numbers uh, of uh, children uh, with rheumatic diseases who, um, you know, who are reported to get COVID, but there are we do have several registries that are collaborating um, uh, with the international um, uh, registry that, uh, that is in adults with rheumatic diseases, as well as the CARA registry, which is reporting um, on children and adolescents who, who get COVID. Um, and you know, we, we certainly don't have enough numbers. Um, and certainly in, in our practice, uh, we, you know, we do see we do see some patients um, who get severe COVID, but um, really it's actually fewer than, you know, we would expect, um, which is somewhat reassuring. Um, and maybe it is because children don't have as many co comorbidities as adults do. And so that may certainly play a role in that. Um, okay, so um, Elaine, you alluded to this question that's coming up. So supplements to boost immunity. Um, do we have, do we have an opinion? Uh, is our opinion evidence-based? There's so many different studies out there on vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc and everything like that. Do you have any, and what do you tell your patients about that? Oh boy. So I'm hoping the panelists will help me out on this one. So, I <laughs> okay. I get these questions, um, daily and you know, I, myself, when I go shopping, I got to tell you, when I see some of these supplements, I'm like, should I be taking that? <laughs> that looks really good. So I, I, I myself fall into that, into that, you know, oh, this is a superfood. Since when did we have superfoods? I thought food was food, right? So, so I'm doing the same thing myself, like, oh, maybe my kid should be on this superfood. So I think there is no, um, if anyone is telling you there's an overnight food pill meditation that you can do that's going to improve your immune strength health i would probably run away right these are these are something that you need to build that you need to see personally what your you know sort of what you're lacking in terms of what you need um, but that would be my answer i i don't think that you know taking vitamin c alone is gonna you know really be the end all be all. Um, I do think that there are um, strengths and um, certain benefits, um, you know, from, you know, taking down sweets, eating, you know, heart healthy foods, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables over, you know, um, you know, drive through fast food chains, right? So, so I think there's that, that balance. Um, so I'm really encouraging my patients um, to really look at themselves to see, you know, they're, they're, they're like five pillars that we know about. If you're, if you're really not getting enough sleep, then sleep is going to be that important thing that you got to do. If you're overweight, then maybe it's the weight thing. You know, if you are smoking and doing other bad habits, that's, you know, something that we need to address. So I think everyone is a little different. If you're really stressed out, you don't have a way to release your stress. then I think mindfulness and stress becomes your important pillar to work. So hopefully that's helpful to hear, but I really don't think there's an overnight answer to that. Jeffrey, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think Elaine did a great job summarizing. I mean, the, the Socrates quote, you know, nothing in excess, everything in moderation. So balance and lots of people, myself included, often find balance elusive. But, um, you know, a healthy diet, sleep, exercise and mental health. And I think that's the thing that suffered for many the most. Um, you know, when those things are in balance, I think people's minds and bodies, of course, are connected. And that's important for your immune system as well as the rest of you. 
Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Yuki, this one is to you. My child is going back to school and is too young to be vaccinated. What are the chances that she will bring it back to me? Should I wear a mask around my own child? That would be awful to have to wear a mask around your own child. I and I think that, you know, uh, the, the, the best way, uh, you know, for you to prevent um, getting infected and for, for your child to uh, not bring it back home is for uh, the child to wear masks at school um, and also for you and your family to be vaccinated. And uh, if you are um, not vaccinated, you know, avoid large gatherings of people, including even, you know, large family gatherings where, you know, even one person who uh, is infected could pass on the infection um, to other people. Um, so um, again, the best protection um, against your getting um, the, the virus is, is by, um, you know, by your child masking indoors uh, with other people and for everyone in your family who is eligible to get the vaccine to get it. Okay. Um, so one of our listeners is asking, are there any health issues that really are a contraindication to getting vaccinated? A history of multiple blood clots, multiple autoimmune diseases. Are there any conditions that any of you have said to any of your patients, I would not vaccinate? Elaine, Jeff, Yuki. <laughs> Jeffrey, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, by and large, no. I, I, I can't think of a single category. I mean, an allergy to the vaccine. So, for example, there's a medicine, Peglodocase, um, that sort of surfaced as someone who might have an allergy to that. That drug name is Cristexa. That's not a commonly used drug, even for people who have gout. Um, that might be the only one that would give me some pause that I could think of as an entire category where I would say probably a bad idea for everybody. So if you've had an allergy against Cristexa, not you're on Cristexa, but if you've developed a bad allergy, because there might be some overlapping components to uh, the vaccine that might cross-react if you had an allergy to that, I, I would think hard about that, but that's a really rare circumstance. Uh, Elaine, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, allergy was the first thing that came to my mind, like if you had some allergy to the first vaccination, then, you know, I, I would not recommend the second, uh, but I can't think of any good example for health issues that I would say, oh, because you have this or this and that, that I wouldn't um, vaccinate you. I do want to bring up the point, I think somebody asked about uncontrolled disease. I, I could see myself if somebody had an uncontrolled uh, immune mediated disease, I would, you know, I'm thinking to myself, if you have a dysregulated immune system and you're not right, you're probably not going to have a good response to the vaccine. So in those cases, I would want that patient to be better controlled prior to probably getting the vaccine, you know, so just a corollary to that question, just because I saw it come up. No, I'm glad that you did. Um, so Yuki, I'm going to, this will be two questions um, to you. Um, this listener's son is turning 12 soon, but very concerned about getting him vaccinated um, and would love to hear your opinion. And, and then why was 12 the cutoff? Well, um, as we said many times um, during this uh, round table, um, really the, the risks of the, uh, the vaccination really far outweigh uh, the benefits um, and the risk of actually getting COVID and becoming sick from it um, for your child and for other people uh, that are that might be exposed to your child who is unvaccinated, uh, really uh, far outweigh any risk uh, of the um, of the vaccine itself. So I would highly recommend that anybody who uh, is turning 12 and has the chance, uh, or is over 12 and has the chance to get vaccinated, get um, the vaccine as soon as possible. Um, if you have been unvaccinated. Um, and your other question was, um, why is 12 the cutoff? Why is oh. the, why is it five to 11? And well, I, it's actually sort of a very arbitrary cutoff. I mean, that's just how the studies were organized. You know, the, the, um, the, the vaccines are studied in, in people who are 18 or over initially, 
And then after that, um, you know, the 12 to 18 age group was chosen as the next to be studied. And that's, and that it has been approved um, for emergency use in that group. And that's why the cutoff is 12. There's no other reason. And uh, it is currently, uh, the, the data is being analyzed for the five to 12 year old group. The studies, um, you know, um, are, have been done and are continuing. And hopefully, um, within the next few months um, or even sooner, uh, we may see the uh, vaccine being approved for the five to 12 year olds, um, which would be great, especially with the uh, schools uh, reopening, et cetera. Um, we don't know exactly when uh, the FDA will approve it, um, but certainly organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics um, is uh, strongly advocating that um, this vaccine be made available to this age group um, as soon as possible. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, so the question reads, if you have more than one autoimmune condition, does that mean your chances of getting COVID increases? Um, so maybe Jeff and Elaine, do you wanna take a stab at that? Um, what I think that they're sort of getting at is this idea of you know, sort of an immunodeficiency that is inherent to having an autoimmune disease as opposed to the medications that you're taking. So can we sort of make people feel a little bit better about that? Elaine, do you wanna go first? Sorry, so your exact question was, uh, sorry, I was reading some question in the no chat. No worries, no worries. So the exact question says, if you have more than one autoimmune condition, does that mean your chances of getting COVID increase? So I think a lot of people who have a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease think that that automatically makes them immunocompromised. So perhaps you can explain that distinction a little. Yeah, bit. I think I alluded to it earlier um, when we were looking at hospitalizations, um, you know, in, in where I practice and, and seeing the ones with more poor outcome. It doesn't seem like it was just the diseases itself. It seems like it was um, the medications that they were on and how immunosuppressed they were. Um, it looked at um, associated comorbidities with that. So I can't say that, you know, given one disease plus another alone, would be, you know, um, the only and end all be thing. I think there's, you know, other factors that become very important for poor outcome. I do know that we have a huge, um, and as um, uh, Jeff and Yuki know, we have a big, uh, you know, COVID-19 registry, you know, which is observational um, that has been ongoing now, you know, now we have more than a year of data on that, you know, looking at some of the differences. And we see that, you know, sometimes being on an anti-TNF inhibitor isn't so bad, but, you know, being on, you know, a JAK inhibitor or rituximab seems like they could have poor uh, outcomes. I also seen some data where sulfasalazine, surprisingly, um, also um, looked like it had um, some outcomes that, you know, weren't as favorable as, you know, being on some of the other medications. So I think the answer to that is that it's going to depend on not just the disease itself and how many you have, but how controlled they are and the, the type of medicines that you need to control those autoimmune diseases. And on that note, Elaine, I don't know if you saw this question, differences in COVID hospitalizations in different types of inflammatory arthritis, do we know RA versus PSA versus lupus versus the medications? I'm, I'm sure we're all waiting for that, right? We've had a lot of different studies along the way that have sort of hinted that our patients are doing reasonably well um, for the most part, but anything else popping out that you guys wanted to share about either if you have lupus versus RA, is it really the disease? Is it the treatment? Is it more the treatment? That's so the what Elaine keeps trying to say. <laughs> compared across diseases. So, you know, lupus and vasculitis seem like they're worse, probably RA. Depends a little bit, uh, if not more than a little bit, on how well the disease is controlled and what treatments you're on. You know, sick unto death lupus or vasculitis in the hospital on lots of steroids, on cytoxan, that's a different story than, you know, lupus with no other medical problems, no comorbidities, only on Plaquenil. So again, it's a little tough to just make sweeping generalizations because you're going to falsely reassure some and you're going to worry others uh, unnecessarily. And the spectrum of illness in lupus and, and all of those diseases is a little bit hard to just generalize. That said, it seems like patients with psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthritis probably have lower risk for hospitalized COVID and bad outcomes. You know, is it the disease and the immune dysregulation? Is it that maybe people are less likely to be on steroids, have fewer comorbidities? Tough to disentangle, but rates of COVID or severe COVID in psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis are lower than in RA and lupus. Yeah, and I think one of those really pivotal studies, Jeffrey, was 
you know, really highlighted the, the impact of the comorbidities in the patients that, that were the main, was one of the main issues driving their, their worse outcome. Um, so this is a good question. What should I do about a potential flare if I stop my medications to make my COVID response better? <laughs> that we chase our tails with. Um, anyone want to take a stab? Jeff, you want to think about that? So the person holds their methotrexate and then they flare. Should they take steroids? Yeah, I mean, it depends a little bit on how bad the flare is, and probably most patients have come to some uh, recognition about what they should do on flare days. Hopefully, that's a topic of conversation between the rheumatology provider and, and patients. It's likely a good thing to discuss with your rheumatologist at the time that your next meeting with her or him about like, what should you do? Uh, there's not that many options, of course, about what to do. You could take more NSAIDs or try NSAIDs. Um, you know, if people have steroids available as part of a short-term course, et cetera. Um, I mean, I would treat it no different than what you would otherwise do on a flare day. Most of this will be self-limited as I think we've already talked through and the usual options for what you would do irrespective of the vaccine, I would probably resort to those same things. Okay. Um, Yuki, a lot of questions on timing of the vaccine and the flu shot. Do they have to be spaced? Um, I, as far as I know, there really is uh, no reason uh, to space out the shots, um, you know, between uh, the flu and COVID. Um, you know, if you can tolerate getting uh, two shots um, on the same day, there's no reason why you couldn't get um, both shots um, so that I'm aware of. Now, I know I early on they were saying like two weeks apart, but I think that was more because of reactogenicity. I don't think that, I mean, we give multiple vaccinations to people uh, on the same day. Um, any, any different input there, Elaine or Jeffrey? It was exactly as you said, if you read old guidelines, it was don't do this. In a clinical trial where lots of times people look at that as what you maybe should be doing, it's it's precisely what you said. You know, if you give two things and the patient has, you know, low grade fever, just feels cruddy for a couple of days, you don't know which of the two vaccines to blame. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't do that in the real world. So at present, the guidance is, is if you need or want to get more than one vaccine, that's okay or a booster and something else like a flu shot, that's okay too. I probably tend to separate them uh, in my practice only because I feel like, you know, we don't have as much info on the COVID vaccine. So unless a patient, you know, has, you know, problems with getting off work and, you know, other things or they live far away, then, you know, at those times, sometimes I do. But on, on a whole, I probably recommend if they don't mind coming back um, to space them out a little just for what Jeff uh, um, and Yuki had alluded to that, you know, sometimes if they get a reaction, we won't know which one it is. And it's just good for them to know um, patient-wise. You no, know, I just realized, Elaine, that is a really good point because if September 20th is really the day, right, the magical day where everyone's going to get their booster, that's also flu shot season. So you're, we will end up probably being able to capture more people to get both of their shots on the same day if they did okay with the first and the second dose. And I would give them maybe the option. We'll see. Um, okay, so last question for all of you guys. Um, I'd like each of you to give us some closing advice. Um, and after that, I'm gonna remind attendees to, that they can go to arthritis.org slash coronavirus for any ongoing updates to the questions that they had tonight. There is a link um, to the uh, FAQs there from the foundation that are updated regularly. So I guess we'll go in the order that we started in. Elaine, do you have any closing advice for our viewers slash listeners? Oh, so many, but I'll only give up <laughs> five seconds. So I think the, the main advice that I would have is that although, um, you know, information that you see on the media or CDC is really meant to, to be as general so that every group is included, but you are, you know, you are special, each patient is special, and that I would really utilize their physician um, to, to help, you know, sort of um, balance um, some of those recommendations versus what you should be doing. I think that would be the best. Otherwise, it gets very complicated. 
so I would agree with that. And it, it's hard to talk about these sweeping generalizations when you know people are individuals. I do think it's useful to look at what medicines might have temporary interruptions or where the timing's relevant. You know, I, I not infrequently get a bunch of emails or communications from patients who sort of say, well, I didn't know that maybe I needed to time that or I needed to adjust that. I just went to the drugstore and I did it. So, you know, the details aren't that important, but look at what the medicines are, see if the thing you're on is in that list of tables and then talk to your rheumatology provider and get the specifics that are right for you. But I encounter a lot of folks who said, well, I just didn't know any better because nobody said anything. And, and I think it's helpful to know just here's a heads up, maybe this affects you. I would definitely, um, yes, I would definitely agree with that. I think it's very important for um, parents of uh, kids with um, arthritis and, and uh, other rheumatic diseases to really consult with their pediatric rheumatologist, um, you know, about to personalize, you know, their care and to really understand, you know, the risks and benefits and, you know, what they should do about their medications. Um, I also uh, would like to, you know, try to uh, reinforce, you know, the fact that the vaccine itself is, uh, is really very safe. There's so much, um, I think that the, the biggest, uh, you know, questions I get from parents about the vaccine are, you know, on unfounded fears. And, um, you know, this is really, uh, you know, in the history of vaccines, probably one of the safest vaccines and the most well-studied vaccine um, ever. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, all the vaccines uh, that are available currently. Um, so I really would um, urge people who are eligible for the vaccine to, of course, consult with your rheumatologist um, about the timing, et cetera, and the medications, but um, really um, go, I mean, go and get the vaccine and um, also give the vaccine to your children who are eligible. You did. Sorry about that. <laughs> I made it almost the whole way. Um, I wanted to, I want to thank all of our viewers and our listeners, and of course, for the Arthritis Foundation for organizing this event. I know I certainly learned something, and I hope everybody else did. Um, so that's it. Stay well, everyone. Stay safe, and have a good night.